morning, church. How's everyone doing? So let's stand together and pray. We'll sing a few songs and then we'll get in the word. Morning. Father, we come before you this morning as your family. Lord, bless this time. Fill this sanctuary with your presence. Holy Spirit, lead us not only in worship, but also in the words that you will speak through Pastor Robert. Let those words go to our heart and let us remember them. And Father, I pray for your people as they go forward in this day and in the days ahead. Watch over them. Keep them safe. Keep them close to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
precious blood of your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for becoming sin for us, for paying a penalty we could never pay. And God, as we open your word now, I ask that you would speak to us. Give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit wants to say this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you seated, would you turn and say good morning to each other? Well, good morning, church. So good to see you guys this morning. A few things to announce before we jump into our study. First, um, I want to make reference to our potluck last week. If you weren't here, we had some bazole. Crystal girl, you knocked it out of the park. We had some menudo. Anthony went and picked up some menudo. I forgot. I don't even. I, 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 it was so good. We had tacos and last week's potluck was really good. The fellowship was good too. The food was great. The fellowship was good as well. And uh, if you've never been to one of our potlucks, I, I want to invite you to join us in our our next potluck. Let me go through just a few announcements because I do have kind of an order of things here. First of all, the gals are going to start their study in the book of Ruth, this upcoming Tuesday evening at 6.30 here at church. If you have not gotten your book or registered, you can go online, look in the app, and you can register online. Or uh, when you see Katie, you can talk to her. Some of the other gals are around the church. I know Patty's here. She'll be attending. And some of the other ladies, when they can either get you the book or, or get more information to you. But they're kicking off their study March 5th here at church at 6.30. Also, guys, just a reminder, next Sunday... We will be, um, Saturday night, we'll be setting our clocks ahead one hour. So just an FYI reminder on that, so you are on time for church. Um, we've had a lending library for some time now, and we have decided to actually change that back room on my left as you're going out. Um, and so what we thought to do is maybe just the books to give the books away, because they were donated. And so if there's any books, I would like to ask you this, if there's any books that has names in them, then ask the person before, just in case they want the book back. Other than that, you can just grab whatever books you would like. There are some really good books in there. I know there's some videos and things like that in there. And as far as the videos, also just uh, let me know about the videos so we can make sure that they are not, if they're a collection that the church had, we'd like to probably keep those. And uh, other than that, please help yourself go through the books and see what's there and uh, help yourself to them. We started this ministry, or going to start this ministry, Shelter from the Storm, and this is a ministry that Melissa Ferenczovic is going to be kicking off on March the 15th, and this is for sexually abused um, girls, and so if you are interested or you know someone that needs to be plugged into this ministry, you can actually go online and register or shoot uh, uh, Melissa an email, and it will go directly to her I know I mentioned this last week. This is not one of those things that will be out on, you know, social media or anything like that. This is going to be strictly confidential and just between the teacher and um, the person that will be attending. And so if you know anyone or if you yourself need this ministry, you can connect with her. I know I saw Melissa this morning and, oh, there she is right there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so you can chat with Melissa. She, she's right there. Well, usually you sit right there, so come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're such creatures of habit. <laughs> our next men Bible study is actually our stake and study, and so that's March 16th. And like always, guys, we want to ask you to register for that because we want to make sure that we have enough food. Um, from what I understand, there's one young man in our fellowship who enjoys the steaks after church, Brian's son. And so are they good? <laughs> They're good. So, so uh, it is a great time of fellowshipping with the guys, but also this uh, second study Second, excuse me, Saturday of the month, this Bible study is good just to get together over a meal, and then we, um, we jump right into the Word. Brian and I have been talking about the next book, and Jack Hibbs has a book out 
Uh, I think it's lost in the days or uh, be aware of the last days and it's D-A-Z-E. And so we are conversing about that, praying about that. And actually, I'm kind of looking forward to hopefully we'll go in that direction because we only have a few more studies left uh, for the men's Bible study. Our next uh, resurrection, or I should say our potluck, which is our Resurrection Sunday brunch, and that's going to be Sunday, March 31st at 8.30 a.m. We've been doing this for a number of years now. We're Sunday morning before Resurrection Sunday. We, uh, we, we just have breakfast, and then after that, we come up, we worship the Lord, and then I just share uh, something real brief from the scriptures. And so if you're interested in joining us that Sunday morning, there's a sign-up sheet actually for uh, this uh, breakfast brunch, Resurrection Sunday brunch, whatever you want to call it, uh, for Sunday, March the 31st at 8.30 uh, a.m. Guys, softball is coming back. And so I know that we're going to be kicking it off around May. And if uh, you guys are interested, just let Brent Lang know, and uh, he can get you connected with what you need. And if we're going to do shirts or whatever it is we're going to, we're going to do, he can, um, can kind of let you know about that. Uh, Amanda Silich is going to come up and share about our diaper drive and meal sign up. And so I'll throw her on the blue mic, guys. but his wife, Christine, is. She's not quite here yet. Um, but they are expecting their first baby, a baby girl, in about four weeks. And so we are going to have a diaper drive. Oh, Christine is coming in right now, front and center. There she is. So, um, <laughs> so she will be expecting a baby soon. And so we are going to collect diapers and wipes for them for the next couple weeks. Um, so feel free to bring those to church. You can put them in the coat room. We'll make sure that they get delivered to to them and they don't have to be all the smallest sizes because you know if you've had a baby they don't stay in those sizes very long so um, we also have about four weeks listed for meal signups um, when you have a new baby that is so much more appreciated than flowers <laughs> something else you have to take care of food is so nice to just have something to pull out of the freezer or heat up and so we'll have a meal sign up uh, you can always do gift cards if you don't want to cook or anything like that they said they didn't have any allergies or, or anything like that they would just be thankful for whatever um, whatever you would bring and um, and so we want to just keep them in prayer in these next couple weeks again this is their first child I have the privilege of doing a childbirth class with them this afternoon and so um, I'm looking forward to that I have not done that in several years um, so that that should be fun and uh, let's just pray for these guys and again we're gonna have I think we have three moms due between April and May, so we'll be talking about this again for the next couple months. Our children's ministry is growing, <laughs> so uh, let's just lift these guys up. Lord, we just want to come before you and lift up Christine and Ben as they get ready to welcome their baby girl to this world, Lord. We just want to ask that, uh, first and foremost, you would have your hand over Christine as she prepares to go into labor, Lord, that you would give her the physical strength that she needs to, to endure that, that time. Lord, give her rest. I just pray that she would be able to um, just have the strength that she needs and that her and the baby would be healthy. Lord, that there would be no complications and that her recovery would go smooth. And I just pray for their, their marriage and their union, Lord, in the days and weeks that follow the birth of the baby as they just adjust to a new schedule and lack of sleep, Lord, and just uh, meeting each other's needs in that season. So I just ask that you would have your hand over them and bless them in that time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Amanda. She's so right. We have quite a few of the gals that are pregnant around the, the fellowship. And I don't know, I, I kind of think that if you want to get pregnant, you have difficulties getting pregnant, just go to Calvary Chapel for about a year. <laughs> and it seems like Every other year, we have at least four or five gals in the, in the fellowship that are pregnant. I'm not kidding, and it's really kind of cool to see. It's really a blessing for me because I get to dedicate them, and then I watch them grow. You know, I look at Sam Sillage back there. I dedicated him. I look at Liam in the back, and these guys are in the sanctuary now, and, you know, they're, they're, they've been baptized and so on and so forth. But um, enough of that. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, would you please open it with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this morning I will finish our series on 
the spiritual gifts. This morning we'll be looking at your spiritual gift and how to identify and use your gift. This is actually part two. Last week I did not have the opportunity to finish. And so this morning I would like to finish this. And then next week we are going to start our study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And so I'm really looking forward to that as we continue our expository teaching and preaching through the Bible. But this morning, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read verses 4 through 11. And if you don't mind, I would like to pray just over this text once again. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Notice what Paul is saying here. The reason why God has gifted us in the different things that he has gifted us in is because we are to use those gifts for the body of Christ, to profit each other, to bless each other. He goes on to say in verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And in verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. God, I do ask that you would bless this text of scripture, illuminate it to us. Help us, Father, to identify the gifts or gift that you have given to us. And Lord, I pray that we would not only be aware of that gift, but we would put it into practice so as to bless you and to bless your church. In Jesus' name, amen. When we began this series, I shared with you in our spiritual gifts, it is God expressing himself through the believer. Uh, I shared with you how God never changes. In theology, we call it immutable. But how he expresses himself through each one of us, it differs. We read there, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but it's the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God. Our gifts enable us to properly express God and catch this to build up the body of Christ, the church. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. And Jesus' all of that discourse is recorded in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And he said in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40, he said that he would come in his glory and sit on his throne. And then he said, I will separate the sheep from the goats. And he said, the sheep will be on my right hand and the goats will be on my left hand. And then he said, I will say to the, to the sheep, Come into your father's kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. And he said, the reason why is because when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And then Jesus said this, and I just absolutely love it. And he said um, to them, you did all these things to me. And in fact, they asked him, they said, Lord, when did, we, when did we give you food when you were hungry? When did we give you water when you were thirsty? When did we visit you when you were in prison? And he said, if you did it unto the least of thee, my brethren or sisters, you've done it unto me. And that's a great illustration because they were actually using their gifts. Someone would go to the jail and visit someone because they would bring the word of what? Encouragement to them because it's very discouraging when someone is in jail, right? Or when someone was hungry, right? And they would come along and they would say, hey, I see you have a need. And they would help in fulfilling that need and the other things that he talked about. In other words, Jesus told them that you were expressing me to people as you used your gift, Last week, we looked at 10 of the gifts, those mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And so I want to just quickly fly through them, and then I want to come to the rest of the gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we just read. First, we talked about prophecy, the foretelling or foretelling of the Word of God. We talked about ministering. It's also called serving or helps. Someone who has the gift of ministering, they will come alongside and help people as we read the or talked about the um, Olivet Discourse. 
teaching, I think that's pretty clear, the ability to instruct and communicate information to people. And it's very clear how that, that information will be um, communicated to them. Exhortation, also called encouraging. I love this gift right here. I love the gift of encouraging or exhortation. I love when people are encouraged by a sermon or someone encouraged by someone else's words or by someone's prayer. Then we talked about giving. Those who joyfully share what they have. Leadership. I think this one is pretty clear. It means to guide. The idea is like you're leading a ship or stirring, stirring, stirring a ship. You, you will take it where it needs to go, avoiding danger. And then mercy, we looked at it last week as well. This is compassion. When Israel removed the ark um, from the Philistines, or the Philistines dropped it back off to Israel, and when it came to a place called Beth Shemesh, 1 Samuel chapter 6 actually records this. It says that the people of Beth Shemesh, they removed the mercy seat and 50,070 people were killed. I made reference to this last week. 50,070 people were killed. Catch this, because mercy was removed. What is mercy? Not getting what you deserve. In Lamentations, uh, uh, Jeremiah talked about, you know, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his compassions, right? Or God is very compassionate. But when you remove mercy, what happened is because the law judged them. When there's no mercy, people get what they deserved. Thursday night, we were looking at First Chronicles chapter 17, and it says this in verse 13, that when God told David about he would build him a house, he said that he would give him mercy, and he would not take mercy from him as he took it away from Saul. And if you know anything about the first king of Israel, Saul, how he sought witches, and Saul just went absolutely crazy in his life. There was no compassion shown anymore in his life. But God promised David, I am going to always show compassion to you. The person who has the gift of mercy or compassion, listen, man, this is, you, they know what they deserve, <laughs> right? When I've done wrong, I know exactly what I deserve. But it is awesome to have someone come along and say, you know what? I'm going to show you mercy. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we need to wink at sin or avoid sin or not calling sin, sin. I'm not talking about that at all because I don't have a problem doing that. But sometimes people need someone to come alongside and just show a little mercy. Man, I know what I've done. I, I'm in fact, you know what, I'm just bumming out right now, but wow, someone just showed me mercy. The other one we saw was the word of wisdom. Sophia is the Greek word. It means intelligence, the ability to discern or judge. Because this is a spiritual gift, this would be divine wisdom, or we would say holy wisdom, or Haggai Sophia. The idea is holy wisdom. And don't associate this with the mosque in Istanbul, where it has a mosque actually called uh, Haggai Sophia. If any of you know what I'm talking about, you're like, okay, good, you made clarity there. This is holy wisdom, divine wisdom, wisdom given to you from above. The next we saw was word of knowledge, gnosis. The idea is understanding or information gained. These two gifts are closely related but radically different. I was last night thinking about these two gifts, and it's hard to <clears throat> talk about wisdom without being reminded of Solomon. You know, the Bible talks about how Solomon was the wisest man in the world uh, during his time. In the book of Proverbs, he talks a lot about wisdom and understanding. He talks a lot about wisdom and knowledge. And I want you to catch this because I want to camp here for just a couple of minutes. When I look in our world today, something that grieves my heart, there are a lot of knowledgeable people. We have a lot of knowledgeable politicians, uh, people who do radio talk shows or podcasts, school teachers. We have a lot of knowledgeable church leaders. And I could go on and on and on, and I think you, 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 you get my point. But some of the decisions I see made are just really bad decisions. Some are illogical. Now, I grew up, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 
I remember my mom would say to me, like, Robert, that doesn't even make any sense. And, and that was what you went with. It's like, that's just so illogical. Robert, that's irrational. That makes no sense. How many, how many of us have heard that? That makes no sense. How many of your mom said, boy, are you out of your mind? In other words, she's saying, it makes no sense. Or that's unreasonable or unsound or unfounded. You know why a lot of very knowledgeable people do foolish things? Because they lack wisdom. Knowledge can exist without wisdom, but not the other way around. You can be knowledgeable without being wise. I heard this illustration the other day, and it says, knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to keep it in the holster. That is a really good quote, and I believe that is so true. See, wisdom gives the correct application of knowledge. Knowledge without wisdom can be very dangerous, as we are seeing today. Did you know that Solomon didn't just ask God for wisdom, but he also asked God for knowledge? I'll show it to you on the screens in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He says, now, O Lord God, yet you, your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge, he says, that I may go out and come in before this people. For you can judge who can judge this great people of yours. And so when Solomon first came to God, understand that Solomon is like, God, I can't do the task that you have put in front of me to lead the nation of Israel. And so he says to God, I not only need wisdom, but would you please give me knowledge as well? And because of that, if you know 1 Kings chapter 3, it says this, because Solomon did not ask for riches, he did not ask for health, he did not ask for all those other things, it says that God just blessed Solomon's socks off. He knew songs. This guy was extremely wise because God gave him wisdom and knowledge. Solomon had the knowledge to go along with the wisdom, and he could figure out pretty much anything. Is that why God gave the church both these gifts? You can't have the other one. You don't want, you want them to go together. It's kind of like giving someone tongues without the interpretation of tongues. You, you, you just, they have to go together. I shared with you last week, first, or, or James chapter 1, verse 5. Remember when James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally. The first time the Bible says God is liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He gives to all liberally and without reproach. In other words, God's like, you want wisdom, Ben? I give it to you. That first kid coming along, right? With, you know, just from time to time, Lord, give me wisdom what to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. And it's like God's like, okay, I'll give it to you. I don't know about you, but from time to time, I feel like a failure as a husband. I don't know about you, but from time to time, I feel like a failure as a dad. Often, I feel like a failure as a pastor and even as a son. I don't call my mom enough. I just don't, you know. Man, I, I got to start calling my mom. She's alive. I need to start calling her more. Just say, Mom, how you doing? I feel like a failure. Maybe one or two people would amen that. You don't have to. But here's the thing. This is one of the gifts we can actually pray for. Because it's just a, if you lack it, ask God and he'll give it to you. So when you do feel like a failure as a dad, Lord, give me wisdom to be the father, my son, my daughter needs. Lord, give me wisdom to be the pastor our church needs. That's one of the gifts that we all in this room, if you don't have it, you can pray for. And FYI, while you're praying for that one, say if you can slide in knowledge, that would be great as well. <laughs> You know, there are times, guys, it just, this is what we need to pause and just ask the Lord, give me wisdom. Let's move on because we have more gifts to, to talk about. We left off with the gift of faith. I noted last week, all believers have faith, but the spiritual gift is a strong confidence that God is going to do what God's word declares that his promises, he will come through with his promises. 
If you doubt from time to time or question why God does things a certain way, it doesn't mean you don't have believing faith in God. You just don't have the gift of faith, strong confidence in God. When James, the Bible says, or yeah, James in John chapter 20, when he was, or Thomas, I'm sorry, Thomas was doubting. And Jesus came to him and said, put your hand here and so on and so forth. And remember, he said, because you have seen, you believe, but blessed is he who has not seen and believe. But Thomas still followed the Lord. He still believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But just that resurrection tripped up all of them. I would say neither one of them probably had the gift of faith, not even the gals, because why would they be going to the tomb? Next is the gift of healing. I noted in an earlier study, some Bible scholars believe the sign gifts, healings, tongues, and miracles are still in operation today, and there are some who believe they ceased at the end of the apostolic age. Um, here at Calvary Chapel, we do hold to a continuationist view, and that is that the sign gifts, they are still in operation today. Although, however, I do believe that there's restrictions on them, and I would even even question tongues today, how it's used, not that the gift cannot be used. I believe that if God wants to go to the hospital right now and heal every child in children's hospital, he could if he wanted to. I just really do. But I don't believe that God could say to Robert next week, I want you to set up a healing ministry, and I just want you to put a big sign out on the front and just say every guy that wants to be healed can come to I don't believe that at all. I believe it's hogwash. I really do. Next is working of miracles, also known as miraculous powers, depending on your translations, which were supernatural events that could only be attributed to the power of God. We often see this in the book of Acts, in Acts 2.22, if I can draw your attention to the screens again. It says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6, did, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In Acts chapter 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and, and signs among the people. And one last verse in Acts chapter 8, verse 6, and the multitudes with one accord and heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, Acts 19, 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul the apostle. We all know if you've ever read through the book of Acts, you know how God worked in the early church through miracles, through tongues, and so on and so forth. Next is discerning of spirits. The akris. The akris is the Greek word, or the akrino, meaning to separate thoroughly, catch this, to discriminate. This is literally what the word means. It's often seen in Romans chapter 2 when Paul was talking about you are inexcusable if you judge another, or another person or you katakrino them, and that means to condemn or damn. And so catch what he's saying here. This is the root of katakrino, krino or krisis, and it means to separate thoroughly, but to discriminate. In other words, you're looking at something and you're saying, oh, no, that's black and that is white. And really, that is not judgment, isn't it? That's just truth. And that's all that is. Someone said to me one day, they said, you know, don't judge me, man. I said, I'm not judging you. I said, I just told you the truth. And that's the world we live in today. Catch, what, catch, catch this right here. When Jesus, again, was on the Mount of Olives there at his Olivet Discourse, he said this in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. Many would come in his name and would deceive many. The gift of discernment is given for the church to protect her from deception. The church of all people, we should be able to say that's black and that's white. And if you say that's judgment, then so be it. That's not judgment, that's truth. That's discriminating between the two, whatever it may be. Speaking in tongues is our next one. Okay, boy. 
This is the ability to use a, a language previously unknown to the speaker. What would naturally follow is the interpretation of tongues, just like I said, wisdom and knowledge. And of course, interpretation of tongues, that is, I think, self-explanatory. Even though the interpreter didn't know the language, they could understand what the tongue speaker was saying, then tell the message. Of all the gifts that we have talked about in the Bible, I think this is the most abused I am hearing it as pastors teach today. Today, some music bands are now starting to, in the midst of music, begin to speak in tongues. In prayer meetings, it is used and there's never an interpretation. Think about tongues like this. It's like having knowledge without wisdom. It's dangerous. To have tongues and not have an interpretation is dangerous. And it can do great abuse to the church. I don't have the gift of tongues. I remember one time when I was like, man, I want to I speak in tongues. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And I, I think I even one time said something, and I was like, I wonder what I even said. <laughs> you know, and it was like, I just, I wanted the gift of tongues. And finally, I came to realize that I don't have the gift of tongues, and I was okay with that. In the 30 years I have been a Christian, I have only seen the gift of tongues biblically used maybe three or four times. And what I mean by that, someone spoke in tongues and then followed it immediately was the interpretation. And it was very clear to everyone. It was, there was no confusion at all. The moment it happened, boom, interpretation happened. And even the person that interpreted it made it very clear that they were what they were interpreting. I have constantly in the 30 years, constantly seen the unbiblical use. So when the real deal is exercised properly, people are suspicious. Was that really the gift of tongues? Isn't that what a lot of us in this room think today? In fact, some of us in this room today, if we were right now, if I were to let people just speak in tongues right now, you would probably not want to come back to this church or say, what are they saying? What's going on? In fact, some people do not even believe this gift simply because they've seen such an abuse of the gift. But I think that can be applicable to any of the gifts when they are abused. It is interesting because of all the gifts, Paul gives more attention to this gift because of the abuse. In fact, I want us to look at it through the scriptures. If you read Romans chapter 12, he hits the gifts and moves right on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11, 4 through 11, we read them. He hits the gifts and he moves right on. Other gifts that he talks about, he just hits on them and he moves right on. Notice the attention he gives to tongues, though. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 4 with me. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Notice this. Tongues is actually for the individual. It's not really even for the church. It only does what? Edifies the one who speaks in tongues, not the church. I think people are better off just speaking in tongues to God at home and just be blessed by it. But he does say, since you guys are coming together as the church, and I want you to notice this, because he's now going to give an illustration of what they were doing in verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, or prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Isn't Paul wise here? He always does this. He'll talk about tongues, and then he's going to give an illustration. And like, wait a minute, if you speak it and you don't give an interpretation, it's almost like, how can I go to battle? How, how do I know that was dun dun dun, dun get ready for battle, right? I don't know that. So you're just sitting there, now you're defeated because of what? You went out, or you didn't go out when you should have gone out. 
He goes on to say, so likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking in the air. And then he gives kind of another illustration in verses 10 through, through 12. Jump down to verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of uninformed say amen or amen at your giving of thanks since... He does not understand what you say. What does amen mean? So be it. I agree. How can someone say I agree to that if they don't get it, if they don't understand it? And a few more verses and then I'll, I'll move on. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. That's radical right there. I mean, he's just like, come on, Paul, you're being, you're exaggerating. He's like, exactly. Five minutes of a sermon, I would rather talk to you than to come up here and speak in tongues over and over and over and over again, and you have no idea what I said. What does that profit you as the church? It doesn't profit you anything at all. Over the years, I have been chided for this passage of Scripture more than you would even imagine. I've, I've been chided for not letting people dance during worship. David danced when he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant in. Yeah, and Uzzah got killed when the ox stumbled too, huh? <laughs> you know, we kind of leave that part out, don't we? And when David later went back and said, how am I supposed to bring the Ark of the Covenant in without angering God? And he said, you do it as God's Word declares. And if you know the passage of Scripture, David then does what God's Word declares. The Levites are supposed to carry the ark, and it's supposed to be carried on, on a card between the Levites and, then, and so on and so forth. And then David got it right because that was the biblical pattern. But what did they want to do? The worldly pattern. This is something that is, I'm afraid of is that we are seeing too much of this abuse of tongues by pastors and by musicians if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go listen to some of the modern bands. And you'll see this where they're, you know, in the music, they're just speaking in tongues and then they're continuing on the music. Music I do love. But I'm like, you didn't have to do that. I was already entered into worship. You didn't have to add that in there because I don't even know what you said now. I don't know as a pastor, man, especially when people chide me for this. I'm like, all I want to do is I want us to do it in the biblical fashion. I think our number one priority here at Calvary Chapel is this. First, to teach the word of God. It's to point you to Jesus Christ. That is my number one call. And my number one call, I believe, is to say let's exercise our gifts, gifts biblically. And the one gift, if we had to leave out any of the gifts, the one gift I would say let's leave out, just leave it outside the church, is tongues. It does not do as much profit to the church, individuals, as the other gifts. I'm not saying I don't agree with tongues. I'm not saying I'm against tongues. But I will say this. I would rather see the other gifts used in this church rather than the gifts of tongues. If you have the gift of tongues, speak it at home. Or else come to a prayer meeting. We'll have an afterglow service. How about that? And you can exercise your gift. But we're going to set aside a certain time just for the gifts in that sense to be used. I know some people don't agree with that, and I'm okay with that. I don't agree with what you do neither, so... We can agree to disagree. Amen? Amen. Amen. Helps, just like it sounds. They help others. They come alongside of others. Guess what is not a gift? Give you a wild guess. Gossip is not a gift. <laughs> you would think some people, boy, girl, you got the gift of gossip, don't you? <laughs> Where is that at? First Corinthians 12? <laughs> you know, no, that's not, that's not in the Bible. Bro, you got the gift of gossip, don't you? Guess what else is not a gift? Bitterness. 
anger. Why do you hold on to that anger or that bitterness like it's a gift and don't want to let it go? Guess what is not a gift? Kevin actually mentioned this in our men's Bible study yesterday, and I thought it was so good, Kevin, man. Perfection is not a gift. And when he mentioned that, I was just like, man, that was so, it was so good. Because sometimes, and this really hit me to the core, because sometimes, you know why I got a white line down here on the pulpit, if you have never seen it, it's because this pulpit has to always be straight. And Bill just a minute ago turned it like that. I was like, man, I'm going to punch him. Wait till, I'm going to punch him. They, they used to always mess with me because I would, the first thing I would do is come up here and I would do, you know, this is all straight and it's like it's even on, and, and it's like I want to be perfect. And it's like God's like, you don't, I didn't ask you to have the gift of perfection. What if the thing is turned this way, could I still preach the same gospel? <laughs> Man, that bothers me. I haven't grown in this, I haven't grown in this yet. Give me some time, okay? I'm working on this. <laughs> I just got this yesterday, okay? I'm working, I'm praying about that, you know? Perhaps it's my trade because I was a tool and die maker and everything always, you know, close to ours, whatever. When he said the gift is not a gift of perfection or I don't have to be perfect, it's almost like it relieves you of a lot, man. And I can just be who God made me to be. Sometimes God has to hone our gifts, work in us and through us. I believe the first probably five or six years of this church I think God did more in me than he did in the church. Let me move on. How do I identify my gift? How do you know what God has gifted you in? If you're taking notes, jot this down first. And I think the obvious is to pray and search the scriptures. Spend some time just asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do for you to further your kingdom? And then just open the Bible and just read your Bible. Spend some time reading your Bible. Often, God will speak to you supernaturally, naturally through the scriptures. 99% of the time, I hear from God through the scriptures. He just speaks to my heart. And um, those are actually fun times, too. Here's the second thing. Ask those close to you. Sometimes, we don't see in ourselves what others see in us. And most of the time, because we're deathly afraid or because we feel inadequate. And sometimes inadequacy is not a bad thing. I got a dear friend up in Tomahawk, Wisconsin, and I think most of you guys know Fred Dreyfel, and he was here preaching not too long ago. And, and I remember we had been talking about a church up in Tomahawk for a long time. I'm in a very long time. And, and uh, he always would kind of say, well, who's going to be the pastor? And who's going to, you know, do this and do that? And I was, you know, you, Fred. And he, he would always say, but I can't remember anything. And... Uh, and I remember just sharing with him, I was like, you guys heard his sermon, right? I mean, y'all ended up sending him cards and clapping for him and all of that. And I was just like, what? <laughs> he wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, I was jealous, man. I'm not kidding. I was, I'm just being true. I was jealous. I was like, he never gave me no card. <laughs> never clapped up. I, I did a sermon, you know. But he just knocked it out of the park, man. I mean, he preached the gospel. And he was just so, I was just like, this guy's been preaching for years. But he just felt so inadequate. In fact, we just heard the other day that they've been given the green light to start a Calvary Chapel in Tomahawk. You know, it's called Calvary Chapel Tomahawk. And that's really cool because God is now going to do a work, I believe, up there. And often that's what happens. Someone else may see something in you that you don't even see in yourself. The only reason that I'm behind this podium is because of Jackie. Oh, yeah, I know. Huh? <laughs> and it's not because she said, okay, you can go do that. But she said, you know, to her, it was a no-brainer. I was like, you know, I'm good just doing what I'm doing, you know. I love my trade. I was good at my trade. It just came so natural to me. But she just said, you know what, honey, it is so clear what God has called you to do. And so now when... She and I, when we're going through something hard in ministry, I'm like, well, you told me to do it. <laughs> it's always so funny. Third, what hits you as we've been going through the gifts? Did anything resonate with you? If something just resonated with you, you're like, man, and it just continues to resonate with you. 
exhortation keep hitting you or mercy keeps hitting you. Or maybe it's the gift of, of music or something because you have a talent, right? It just keeps hitting you. Perhaps that is your gift. I, I, I believe I've been given the gift of exhortation and it just keeps hitting me. I love to encourage the body of Christ. I love to come alongside people and just encourage them. You know, I really do. It's, it's just, I, I, I thrive on it. And it just, going through it, it just kept hitting me. What, what has been just hitting you, resonating in your heart? Maybe you got the gift of overseeing potlucks and making sure we always have potlucks, you know. That is a gift, man, you know. That's... Fourth, how do I know my gift? How do I... How do I know what God is calling me to? The Holy Spirit will be wooing you. You think about it all the time. It's constantly in your mind because the Spirit of God is wooing you. He's drawing you. Even if you try to shake it out of your mind, it's like you can't. The prophet Jeremiah wanted to quit his gift. He became so discouraged that he said to God, in fact, I want to show you this verse, he said to God in Jeremiah chapter 29, or Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And he says, I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. If you know anything about Jeremiah, he was the last prophet to prophesy to the southern tribes before they went into Babylonian captivity. And it's really kind of cool because Jeremiah was like, man, I was just like, I'm done, Lord. I quit my gift. But it was like his word was, it, in other words, the Holy Spirit just continued to woo Jeremiah. It was just in Jeremiah's heart. He just could not shake it. And so he had to speak forth what God called him to. And lastly, say that you have the gift of helps. God will work that gift out like this. Maybe about a year ago, we had a channel up there. It kind of fell down, and maybe some of you guys remember it's got wires going through it, and, and it was hanging down, and <laughs> this is something else Kevin brought up yesterday, and, and we were talking about it, laughing about it. And for probably two weeks, Sunday morning, Kevin would come into church, and he would look at that channel, and it would bother him to no end. Finally, he says to Scott, can we sneak in the church and fix the channel? <laughs> Megan, I bet he drove you nuts, didn't he? <laughs> Because that's what happens when you have the gift of helps. FYI, you don't ever have to ask somebody to get in. I give you a key to get in if you see something wrong. And you can just come right in. But it just keeps stirring on you. You notice it. Some of y'all probably never even noticed it. Some of you are probably like, what is he talking about? You just don't have the gift of whatever administration. But a person that has that gift, it will continually just be stirring in them, stirring in them. Once you identify your gift or gifts, start using it or them to glorify God and build up his church. Find a place to serve and listen to me here, and you will be amazed at how blessed you'll be. I don't know of anything more blessed to me and in my life than doing what God has asked me to do, serving the body of Christ. I mentioned it to you a number of times. One last thing, and I will close. The need does not constitute the call. I was talking about this Thursday night. The need does not constitute the call, but the gift does. Just because we may have a need in the children's ministry or a need to do this or to do that or whatever it may be in the church, it doesn't constitute the call. Thursday night we were talking about when David wanted to build God a house, Nathan told him to go for it. Do all that is in your heart. And God came to Nathan the prophet and said, go tell David I'm not calling him to build me a house. In fact, I'll build him a house. And because there was a need, it didn't call, God didn't call David to take care of that need. The need never constitutes the call, folks, but the gift does. When you're gifted, it will fit. Even in the struggles of whatever that gift may be, it will fit. It's almost like you wouldn't, you don't really want to quit, but you want to press in even more. If you need prayer this morning, I would love to pray with you and to pray for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you walk with him this week. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hey, you are gifted. Every one of us in this room 
we have been gifted by God. And as I said, one of the most blessed things that I have experienced in the Christian life is using that gift to glorify the kingdom of God and the people of God. Let's stand together and pray. Father, thank you. And we love you so much. And we thank you so much. Because, Lord, really it's you wanting to work with us and through us. You wanting to use us to bless each other. But most importantly, Lord, to glorify you and to bless you. Thank you so much for how you, how you use us. Thank you so much for how you shine your face on us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I ask you, Lord, help us as a church to be able to apply these truths so as to better serve you and each other. Would you go before us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day, folks.